good afternoon, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Transportation Commission meeting for today. Um, I'm going to call the meeting to order, and we're going to start start off with a roll call of the participants. Um, so please state, uh, indicate in some manner of your presence uh, when you're called. Brendan Crookshank. Justin Denardi. Good evening, all. Present. Matt Eckhoff. Present. Good afternoon. John Hansen. Bob Kuhn. I'm here. And Josh Stone. Uh, present. Excellent. So that makes five of us. So um, we're good to go. Um, should I run through and see? Indicate that you guys are all here as well, Jeff. OK, um, so we're going to start with public comment. At this time, any member of the public may address the commission on any subject within the commission's jurisdiction. That is not on this meeting's agenda. The Arizona Open Meeting Law prohibits the Commission from discussing or taking action on an item that is not listed on the prepared agenda. Commissioners may, however, respond to criticism made by those addressing the Commission, ask, ask staff to review a matter, or ask that a matter be placed on a future agenda. To address the Commission on an item that is on the agenda, please wait for the Chair to call for public comment at the time the item is heard. With that, is there any public comment? Seeing none, we will move on to new business. So we'll start with item number one, role of the Transportation Commission. wasn't turned on. Thank you. Thank you. This is an item we've had on the agenda probably at least four times, if not more. Um, nothing huge here, just an opportunity to make sure all the commissioners and the first reason this came up was we had several new commissioners and it was just felt like a good idea to run through um, what we call the enabling legislation, which this is essentially the city code that creates the Transportation Commission. There's enabling legislation for all the different commissions at the city. Um, and this is the Transportation Commission's. If you've looked ahead on the PowerPoint, it's not real um, sophisticated here. I did a lot of screenshots. I just wanted to walk through things. Um, as always, just stop me and ask questions. If you have any questions about things, I'll go relatively fast, but I just want to make sure everyone's seen this once, kind of has an idea. There's a couple of spots I want to ask a few questions specifically about how we do business compared to what's actually in the code. And then I also added, um, a little section of city code and a little section of Arizona revised statutes, which is state law. And those are those three things are probably what we'll mostly be encountering as a commission together. So here's the Transportation Commission enabling legislation. It's in chapter two of city code and you can see the sections and I'll just I won't read them. We'll just go through them. So this is this is it. This is what how the commission's essentially named or it's created. Um, in the exercise of powers vested in the city council for the protection of the public safety and promotion of the general welfare to promote the safety of the traveling public and to improve utilization of the public ways for all forms of transportation. So that's essentially what the transportation is in a sentence. Here's um, the membership. That was bouncing. Uh, here's the membership. So we know we have seven voting members, five at large, and then we have one member from FUSD um, and one member from NAPDA. So that's um, Justin Denardi and, and Josh Stone currently. And then five at large members. Some commissions require certain uh, backgrounds or skills for the members. For us, it's just citizens of the city of Flagstaff. Two, officially it's two ex officio non-voting members. So chief of police for us, it's usually a lieutenant and currently we have 
Lieutenant Turley assigned, and then my position or designee, and that's usually me. Um, and annually, we'll have a, a uh, chair and a vice chair, which we do about annually. We did recently. Terms of office, this one's kind of interesting. Um, the terms are staggered, and that's why when some of you, I'm like pointing at nobody, <laughs> um, you're not nobody, but the rest of the crowd is not here. Um, <laughs> it's pretty funny. Uh, three year terms, and when you're, if you're not replacing someone who ran a full term, then you get a partial term. And so it could be a one year term, could be two, could be two and a half, whatever. Um, typically, those partial terms don't count against your two full terms. So that's, that language is specific. So you'll always get two full terms if you're reappointed, and you can have up to like two and a half years on other terms. So sometimes we have people for eight years um, if it works out that way. The other thing that's interesting that is I find interesting and I often misunderstood by commissioners is even though your term ends, if there's not somebody to replace you, you can keep attending and we encourage you to keep attending. So your eight and a half years could go on for quite a while if we don't have um, someone to replace you. So be aware of that when your terms come near end that we may ask you to just keep coming if possible. So and of course you're appointed by the city council. And this is rarely enacted, but um, or acted upon miss three consecutive meetings and you may be terminated and that basically if we have a member that's not been showing up a lot, we'll talk as a group and then we'll raise that with the city council if we if we choose to do that. But it's it's rarely rarely the case. Meetings, um, we schedule meetings, as you know, on even numbered months at 4 p.m. first Wednesdays. The first Wednesday of four is not dictated by city code. We talked at the last meeting about switching this up, and I've been talking to the Historic Preservation Commission. They don't want to switch with us. So we that's why you saw appointments come out for first Wednesdays again next year. So we'll be first Wednesdays of the even numbered months next year. Officially, we are supposed to meet quarterly. So we're really we're we should be meeting at least four times. Um, we do six, so we're doing doing pretty well. And of course, four members is for voting members as a quorum you could have a meeting without me because i'm not officially needed um this is maybe the more interesting part so here's some of the functions formulate and recommend policies and ordinances to the city council governing the general operations of streets alleys sidewalks and bikeways to review periodically traffic regulation actions and i'll um get in a little more detail i think on the next slide on that one and then to promote ped bike transit and driver education programs in the schools and to disseminate traffic and safety information to the public at large, something we probably don't do very often, if at all. Um, oops. That really went forward. Um, so this is, tra these are traffic, this is what traffic regulations look like, and they're pretty small and the details don't matter so much, but essentially when um, issues arise throughout the community, either from maybe a developer lets us know of something that's in coordination with a private development project or maybe something in coordination with a capital improvement project could be a citizen request could be staff driven public works driven police department driven we go out and create these work orders um, for public works to install striping to remove striping add signs remove signs and anytime we create a new restriction or remove a restriction so if we add a new no parking zone change of speed limit, any of those things, that's a regulation. And um, way back, all of these had to go to city council. So I understand almost every city council meeting, there would be one of these on the agenda. At some point, city council delegated this to staff. And so we do this continuously throughout the year. Um, the Transportation Commission enabling legislation says that we should review these with the Transportation Commission periodically. We've done this periodically and the commissioners tend to kind of fall asleep as I go through all of these. Happy to do this. Um, so that's one of the stopping points where I wanted to ask, are you all interested? And we can do it once and just see if you're interested. Um, we could go through all the 23 regulations. Um, doesn't take a ton of time, but that was a point I wanted to stop and see if there was interest in seeing that and we could do that in February. I could wait to the end as well. See the chat. 
No. Okay. I'll keep. I can keep going, and we can we can remember this as a question. Here's item D on the functions of the commission to annually advise city council on the progress and expenditures of the city's streets and transportation capital improvements program funded by the transportation tax from November of 814, which is an old tax. This is not the newest tax, so this language needs to be updated, um, but this is also kind of a question. We have done this, but very briefly, those of you who been on the commission for a while, Trevor Henry, Henry usually shows up once a year and kind of goes through a spreadsheet talks about things. So I think this is still important to the commission, and I think it's important to the city council that, that someone sees this as well as them. Um, but this will need, we do need to go back in and clean up this language because this is dated to November of 14, which doesn't cover the current November of 2018 transportation tax. I'll come back and confirm that one, but I think, I think that one's easy. And this is a continuation of D, it's four, five, and six. Provide a public forum for public comment. Of course, we do that, it's a public meeting. Publish an annual street and transportation CIP advisory report. That's not something we've done in at least 10 years. And I don't know that there's value in that. Um, so we may clean that out of here when we do some cleanups. And present the findings of said report to the city council during a public meeting in conjunction with the annual budget process. So that used to happen on occasion. That would actually be the Transportation Commission chair would present at the budget hearings for city council. Um, typically staff does that. So I don't know that that's something we need the commission to do, but maybe something we can talk about at the end of this um, discussion. Other powers, the commission shall have the power to appoint subcommittees, and this is one of the commissions that does have two subcommittees. Of course, you know, BAC and PAC, they meet first Thursday and second Thursdays, 4.30 in the uh, council conference room behind the wall behind us and online. So that's kind of the run through of the commission. Um, we had a couple of questions. Should we pause now or you want to wait to the very end? I haven't seen anybody chime in on the chat yet now. Okay. I can keep going. Uh, this is this is Title IX, so this is more city code. The Transportation Commission is in Title II. This is Title IX traffic code. So this is what um, sets up several things. You can see traffic code in general. There's two repealed sections. This is where the bike code is, all the bike rules. Loading zones have their own section for some reason. Um, and I'll just jump into it and it'll make more sense. So here's 9-1, the traffic code. So this is, I'm not gonna read them all, but you can see there's specific speed limits. These are some handful of speed limits that are adjacent, that are unusual, that are adjacent to schools essentially. Stopping, standing and parking re restrictions. This actually mirrors Arizona revised statutes, the 15 feet from a hydrant and all of those different things. Um, and then I won't read them all, but um, third from the end is one of the more recent ones, which is the use of wireless communication devices. That's the distracted driving ordinance that was put in place a few years ago. Highlight this one specifically just because it's it's important. So this is this is the this is where the traffic engineering program and specifically the office of the traffic engineers, what it's called, is established. So this is unusual. I don't think there are any other positions in the engineering division. Maybe the city engineer shows up somewhere as well, but this is kind of unusual. But this gives this explains all of the duties and powers, if you will, of what the traffic engineer should be doing. So we we prohibit or may require boulevard stops, kind of an old terminology, boulevard stops, right of way, speed limits, school crossings, ped and bike lanes and routes, parking, parking limits, safety zones, U-turns, left-hand turns, right-hand turns, traffic lanes, public carrier stands, all sorts of stuff. So all those things are the responsibility of uh, the traffic engineer. This keeps going. This one, this one talks about requests for modifications. So those regulations we talked about, if if a citizen didn't like where we put a you no know, parking zone or something, they may want to appeal. Typically, we it's number one first, which is the appeal of the decision. We sit down with me and the city engineer sit down with the aggrieved party. I've actually never seen it be appealed to the Transportation Commission, but that's why I bring this one up, because potentially someone who doesn't like the parking regulation we put in may come in and want to um, have a hearing with the Transportation Commission. Another thing that we follow a lot 
um, and guides a lot of what we do are the Arizona revised statutes, in particular Title 28. So this is kind of near and dear to the police department and near and dear to transportation operations. It goes on and on and on and on. It's kind of interesting. This is way, way, way more detail than you ever encounter when you're doing like your driver's test, but this is where all of those things come from. Just highlight a couple to give you a sample of what they look like. So this is stopping, standing and parking, and this is just the beginning of it. But this is where, for example, um, you know, parking regulations so like that last one. Here's I keep bringing this. Oops, keep bringing this one up. But within 15 feet of a hydrant, that's where this originates from. No parking within 15 feet of a hydrant it comes from Arizona revised statutes. Other states may have different rules. Other cities may modify this. I believe you can be more strict. So we maybe city Flagstaff wanted to go 20 feet. We don't in this case, but this is how this is kind of built. No parking within an intersection, no parking in front of driveways, on and on and on, no parking and on a sidewalk. Another one that's interesting, this one I, I highlighted because I just bumped into it and this one often comes up, but this is kind of how right-of-way rules in Arizona work. Every state, not every state is different, but many states have different regimes and this is how it works in Arizona. So basically, pedestrian can enter a crosswalk marked or unmarked. Every intersection has a crosswalk. That's defined in another, unless posted otherwise, that's defined in another section. But pedestrian can enter a crosswalk and has the right of way if they haven't entered the crosswalk in a manner that makes a car stop abruptly. So basic rule, but often uh, often confused in Arizona for some reason. That was my last slide. We had a couple of questions about, um, I can go back, let's see. Do you have interest in regulations or seeing kind of a sample or a listing of work orders for the previous year? It was my first question, I believe. Thanks, Jeff. Um, anybody online? I don't see any questions. Anybody want to chime in? Um, I guess, Jeff, I would be interested uh, in seeing just how onerous those are. Okay. Um, and I don't know if there's a way to, yeah, provide them as an exhibit and then kind of breeze through them during the meeting or something like that. Um, without going into the detail of every one of them. Yeah, we we can create a packet, a PDF packet, and then just have a listing. And if there's questions, we can jump into any of them or just have them read, available so we could pull them up and talk through them. That sounds good. Um, what we're doing generally with the CIP, is that acceptable? Trevor comes once a year roughly with the spreadsheet. Martin usually comes with his spreadsheet. Uh, this is a little more, this is more extensive. This says there'll be a formal report. The report will be presented to the city council by the commission. Um, again, we haven't done that in a very long time, but it's still our code. So it'd be nice to clean that up if we're not going to, going to do that. Any, any input from online? I don't see any questions listed. Um, yeah, I think I think this point bears further discussion. Um, okay. I think it'd be interesting to hear from City Council. Maybe Council Member, Council Member McCarthy could provide some input to this. But um, just what exactly the uh, the City Council would see as um, a beneficial input from us. Um, I think I'm not sure if just like a once a year presentation fulfills the. You know, like I'm not sure how much that is us advising it versus us just kind of okaying it. And I don't know, you know, there's a lot of stuff in there, so I'm not sure how much uh, we're able to advise anyway. But um, yeah, I guess personally, I would be interested in uh, either updating this to the current transportation tax or making some comment about transportation taxes in general. Council member? Um, I think the council would be interested in this input. As far as if it's done by staff or by uh, maybe you as chair to the transportation 
I think we can go either way just to get the information. So on the other hand, it is good to get commission members in front of council. So, you know, I mean, one of the reasons that I come to these meetings is to, you know, get to know you and give input when appropriate. So uh, it could go either way, but it might be good to have you. Yeah, so I'd say maybe next year we give it a shot and talk about what that would look like, um, whether it has to be a formal report or just a, a presentation um, to help out with. Any other comment uh, based on what I said from the group? Looks like we have one comment online from Josh Stone. At what point in the city budget process is that? Yeah, so that's a that's a good question. Um, and that's probably what the kind of the discussion is about. So typically when this comes to the Transportation Commission, it's it's kind of a done budget. And so the commission sees what's basically done a couple of weeks before the city council sees that final version. That's what we've typically done. So um, capital is starting right now and staff's work doing inputs, doing end of year stuff. And we'll so now is December. We won't be done until like March or April with all the internal staff stuff. And that's when you typically see it. And then city council sees it at like, I think a retreat in the middle of April roughly. So that's the typical process. If we were more extensive, then you might have already had a meeting to talk about this. Like you're, you might need to see it in October. You might need to see it every month, October, December, February, and April. You probably need four meetings to keep up with the things that we're doing. Or so, there could be something in between, but that's roughly the timeline. Yeah, I was just uh, I was envisioning something earlier and then something more final. So because um, once once it's final, then it's sort of too late to really have much of a um, a say in it. So yeah, you're you're correct. Yeah, the way it works now, we're just advising you of what's happening basically. Right. And so every earlier or more often you'd have more input than just advise. Right. So yeah, if you're looking for more than advise, we can maybe, maybe what we can do is staff can work on kind of a process. We're in the middle of it already. So it may be, it will be tricky to do different things this year, but um, maybe we come back to you with something more specific. And then we go from there. I have a third question. I can't remember. I think that that was it. I think it was just those two. OK. Any other questions? The only other thing that I wanted to mention is that the board and commission member training was earlier this week. I didn't see anyone's name from this commission had attended, um, but I will forward that presentation to you all. It's a good refresher of of everything about commissions. So. I'll forward that out to everybody. You can take a peek. Those that have already had the training, of course, it's just review. If you haven't had the training, you probably need to catch it next time that it's that it's um, available. I know they don't like you going too long as a commissioner without going through that formal training. With that, that is what I have for this item. Great. Thanks so much, Jeff. Sure. And with that, we'll move into Section two, city flagstaff transportation engineering standards update. Oops, uh, before we do that, um, is there any public comment on uh, item number one? Not seeing any, um, we'll close that item out. My apologies. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, Stephanie Santana, transportation engineer here at the city. Um, I will be going over some engineering standard changes that relate to transportation that I would think that this commission would be interested in. Um, it's pretty darn informal, so please in, um, interrupt me whenever you'd like to. Um, I will put up on the screen the actual updates that we'll be making, and I would ask that people, as they want to, would follow along with the summary sheet. Um, if anyone in the audience would like a copy of that, I've got about three of them right here. Um, 
So this is the summary sheet that was sent out. Um, I could also throw it in the chat or Jeff can as well if someone online would like to have that easily accessible. So just shoot Jeff a message and he can forward that into the chat. I have a quick question, Stephanie. Yes. Um, how often do you guys update these standards and when was the last time that they were updated? That's a great question. I should have come super prepared. I, I believe it was 2017. Um, I'm looking behind me. I, I know I worked on the standard drawings around 2015, but I don't think they actually got approved until 2017. So um, that's what's in my mind right now. <laughs> and how often? Um, it's as often as we kind of can get to it. So 2017 to 2023, it's pretty bad, but I know we have a goal of doing it more recent. Jeff got something. No, I think that those dates are perfect. I will say that sometimes we have specific items that we bring in between the big cycle, like we did lighting two year, roughly two years ago. Maybe it was three years ago now. So that was a fairly big chapter, but it was specific to lighting. This is kind of a general all the way across the whole standards cleanup. But yeah, I, I think 17 is about right. Yeah, that's what I just found on the ordinance. It was 17 and lighting looks like 2020 actually. Not too bad, <laughs> not too bad. Uh, anyways, so yeah, any any further questions before I jump into them? Hearing none, seeing none. All right, so on the summary list, um, the first one that is listed is um, construction traffic control plans. Um, the first two pages of this summary list include, I'm going to call it wordage changes, so words in the code versus the actual engineering standard details. So that's the first two pages, and the last two pages are actual standard details where I'm in AutoCAD and, you know, making little changes to the drawings. So um, I'm just going to run through these ones fairly quickly. Um, Martin will come up and talk about some of his as well. So the first one is traffic control plans. Um, we had a few administrative changes that are the first four bullets or so, um, a little something semi-interesting maybe. Uh, fifth bullet down, we added bicycle and pedestrian accommodations need to be made during temporary realignment or rerouting of existing facilities. Um, so we've had issues with that in the past and we wanted to just get that in these engineering standards so that contractors are required to provide that. Same with ADA accessible routes. Um, so I don't know how we didn't have this in the engineering standards previously, but we're now adding a note that they need to accommodate ADA accessible routes. Number seven, um, transit agency. Um, so the permittee needs to reach out to, uh, to the transit agency approximately a minimum of three days in advance if a transit stop will need to be relocated. And then just the last one was semi-interesting as well. Uh, VMBs are variable message boards and we are requiring we made a comment in there of, of when those are required and on what routes and what types of closures and locations of them and whatnot. Um, so that was pretty much it, summary of the traffic control plans. Um, the next two I'm gonna kind of combine, it's the sewer system design and the water system design. So we added a statement that water valves and manholes need to be located outside of sidewalks, bikeways, bike lanes, and foot trails when feasible. So that kind of fell into the sewer and the water valves. Um, the next one Martin's going to tackle. He's made a lot of changes in um, chapter 13, 14, the foot section, which literally I think was one paragraph before and he's expanded it significantly. You want me to open something? Yeah, thank you, Steph. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the commission, um, my name is Martin and I'm the multimodal transportation planner for the city. And as Steph mentioned, uh, this chapter in the engineering standards before had almost nothing in it, just a reference to a design document. Uh, we have taken a lot of the information that was previously included on the foot standard detail and moved it uh, as text into this chapter. So before the, the foot standard detail had a lot of text associated with it, and we have moved that into this chapter. Uh, not a lot has really changed substantively with the requirements. They've just been moved from one place to another, but I'll go through them and let you know which ones have moved and which ones are, are actually new. Uh, so we've divided the chapter into two uh, divisions at the moment. One is for ped and bike facilities, and here we only have the reference to AASHTO design guidelines. And then the second division is for the uh, FOOTS or Flagstaff Urban Trail System. And I'll go through those sections fairly quickly. Uh, first one on section number one references design guidelines. AASHTO is the current um, standard for that. 
So we have updated that. Uh, number two gives a variety of trail dimensions. Again, these are not different than what we currently require. They're just put in a different place. Uh, a couple of them, uh, the ones that are listed in bold in your document are actually new requirements. Um, so we add new requirements for a horizontal clearance of three feet, uh, vertical clearance of 10 feet above the trail, uh, grades not to exceed 8% running along the length of the trail, uh, design speed uh, for a paved trail of 20 miles per hour and for an aggregate trail of 15 miles per hour. And then it references horizontal and vertical curves as listed in the AASHTO document. So those are new standards uh, clarifying um, what we had before. Section three talks about structural requirements, and these are divided into paved trails and unpaved trails. Uh, again, most of them are, are just copied over from the standard detail. We did add a new gradation spec for the surface material for foots trails uh, before the material uh, began at a size of one inch and then worked its way down into, into finer material. And we have changed that to start at a quarter inch and work its way down. So if you're familiar, familiar with, with some of the newer trails that we've built, it really matches the, the material that we've been using on aggregate uh, trails. And, and on city projects, it's been relatively easy to spec that material. When trails are built by developers, we really need to have it in the engineering standards to make it enforceable and to give them some predictability uh, so they know what they're supposed to build. Uh, moving down, um, section four copies over information about expansion and control joints. Uh, this gets into um, some kind of technical details, but the basic idea is we want the joints to be as smooth as possible. So think about wheeled vehicles going over them, uh, not only bikes, but um, scooters, uh, people pushing strollers, wheelchairs, anything that has uses wheels is gonna is not gonna feel those those bumps uh, nearly as much. Uh, section five talks about shoulders. Um, shoulders are really meant to be a recovery zone for bicyclists. So we want them to be uh, material that's suitable. Uh, six talks about radiuses between street and sidewalk transitions. Uh, most of this is not new, but was copied over. And then finally, uh, section seven uh, is about foots fencing. And most of this is new. Uh, we do have standard details for the fencing, but this adds a whole bunch of language about when it ought to be used and what considerations uh, to include. Most of the language here is taken from AASHTO. Uh, we're just repeating it um, in the city zone standards. And there is one last section on ped and bike underpasses. And, and here uh, we changed the minimum width dimension for a tunnel. Uh, before it was based on the width of the tunnel, it was kind of a sliding scale. Here we narrowed it down to just, just a couple of discrete um, benchmarks. So um, up to 60 feet and more than 120 feet. And then the, and the tunnel will get wider uh, as the tunnel gets longer. Uh, we also clarified that the minimum clearance uh, for a tunnel is 10 feet. And so either, um, I guess I can answer any questions or we can turn it back over to Steph and have her go through the remainder of the changes. Thanks, Martin. Um, I don't think it's helpful to follow it over here, so I'm just going to keep summarizing until we get to the fun drawings. Um, so intersection design is the next one that we're at. A few of the bullets that may be interested, um, developers, contractors may be interested, is that we change the approach grade to intersections for signalized or likely to become signalized intersections from 2% to 3%. Um, we've had multiple requests for this over the years um, to allow for a greater percentage because of all of our hilly, hilly city. Um, we've added an approach grade for roundabouts to be 4% for 200 feet. And I think that's about that for that um, section. The next two sections are regarding street lighting. Um, I'm going to kind of combine those two sections together. Um, we changed the maximum EPA to 1.5 square feet to match the design of our new signal pole design standards. So we've never had in our engineering standards um, signal pole designs for street lights um, and for signals, sorry, traffic signals, not street lights. So we've uh, added a section in there. And within that section, we do have a little bit less of a um, square footage. Um, 
maximum EPA square footage in there for these new poles. So we had to update that section to, to match with our new traffic signal pole section. Um, and then we've also updated the AASHTO reference to a more recent version. Moving on to the signal design. So that's what I was just starting to, um, sorry, that was a little bit further. So signal design elements, we added that signal cabinets, poles, push buttons, and street light poles shall be outside of the pedestrian bicycle ways, and that full width shall be maintained. We also referenced a um, newly added pedestrian push button location standard drawing. Um, we added a statement that push buttons shall be located to meet ADA requirements. We changed a couple signal heads that people probably don't care about. Um, we added, and, and this is where we added the new section for the traffic signal pole design requirements. So I think it added about eight new pages to our traffic engineering um, drawings that we'll go over in a second. <coughs> Excuse me, the specification describes the general requirements for travel -like signal equipment to be installed within or supplied to the city of Flagstaff. Moving on, um, the next section is signal construction. We specified um, a bag for new traffic signal pedestrian heads. So a quick summary on that one. Um, when a new traffic signal is installed um, for a period of time, it's not turned on until the cabinet's done and all of the mechanicals and wires and all that stuff is worked out. So they need a bag of traffic signal heads and pedestrian heads. So um, sometimes they'll just throw a trash bag over it or just some random sack. So we actually gave a specification for what type of bag needs to be put on it, wind, wind resistant and weather resistant and whatnot. Anyways. Um, TMI, got it. Uh, traffic signs is the next one. We added a statement that traffic signs shall be located outside of the pedestrian and bicycle ways. Pavement markings, we added a statement um, of the, tip, the, the specific standards that we follow, MUTCD, Arizona supplement to the MUTCD, and some ADOT guidelines. Um, the next one is installation and placement and planting. So in, in the landscape section of the engineering standards, it discusses line of sight at intersections and driveways. And we've updated that section to, to match more closely with the AASHTO standards, which is what we follow for this type of thing and updated a figure. Um, lastly, we added an addendum to the MAG standards, um, which is for plating. So if a utility company is coming in and um, digging a trench and doing stuff under the roadway, they need to place plates over it overnight or something. Um, we added that plating is not allowed um, the months of November for a and to April for snowplow operations. It's a mag standard typically, so they don't have snow down there, of course. So um, that was it for the wordage section. Um, I'll jump down to the engineering standards. And I'll, tr I'll try to go quickly on the ones that you may not care about. Um, so this is a standard delineator um, engineering standard. All we did was update the sign to meet the more current MUTCD sign. Um, this was a whole new engineering standard page that we added. Um, we designed to this currently um, if a median is placed on a roadway, I believe it's collector or arterial roadway, they're required to put these signs, um, the squiggly arrow with the median and the um, chevron sign under it. This just explains where to put those, um, where they're located, the MUTCD number, whatnot. This is the bus pullout that already exists. And we added a note down here that when the shelter is adjacent to a foots trail, the foots shall be aligned behind the shelter. We um, have been seeing a lot of these bicycle exit and entrance ramps coming in for recent projects. Um, we're seeing them at every new roundabout that we're building. For example, Beulah University roundabout, a four seater locket roundabout. Um, and and the interchange um, Route 66 and New Lone Tree. So we're just seeing these ramps um, come in a lot and we wanted to standardize a specific design um, that worked with our public works department, plows, and that's just a more standard so that they're consistent throughout the city. The next one we've added is a pedestrian push button location. Um, so ProWAG, Shouldn't have even said it because now I'm gonna have to think of the actual words for it. Public right away. 
accessibility, something, something, um, ADA uh, requirements and whatnot. So um, we tried to standardize a location for pedestrian push buttons because we've had some issues in the past where sometimes they're located within, you know, a foot's trail in the middle of it and it's taking away the width of the foot's trail or it's, um, you know, not meeting ADA standards, um, certain things like that. So we wanted to put out there um, our recommendations as we try to follow the METCD and the PROREG requirements. So we did our best at locating that with dimensions and and things on this drawing. And we added the same note down here that we had put in the wordage section, maintain full uh, sidewalk width between push button and back of walk. And then we're asking that uh, signal poles are located behind the sidewalk. So this is a whole new standard that'll be added, hopefully to provide clarity. I'll go quickly through these next eight pages. This is the section uh, traffic signal pole design requirements. Um, a lot of this is, um, you know, public works that's out there building this and checking our um, construction plans to make sure it follows this. But we wanted to get this in here so that we have consistent poles being placed out there for traffic signals. I'll go quickly through them. Lots of tables, lots of details. Examples of different um, mast arm spans, how the heads fit, where they're supposed to be located, whatnot. Um, down to the pedestrian rapid flashing beacon, typical layout. So the previous name of this was um, circular rapid flashing beacon. We've changed the name on here. Um, of course, everything else on here that we've circled are also changes. Um, we specified a brand for the cabinet and a battery backup system. Um, I, I actually think kind of interesting that a company created a standard specifically for us since we're doing many of these um, rapid flashing beacons around town. So they can just call up this company and ask for the Flagstaff standard. Um, moving on, um, on this page, we've added a few more signs. Um, so what we're looking at is the mast arm of a rapid flashing beacon. We added a sign above it, a pedestrian walking sign. And then we've also added shark's teeth. That's what these little guys car called the pavement markings. Then we've added a sign here that says yield to pedestrians. Moving on, we've made some changes to this. Um, this is the Reed special sign right here. Um, I believe it was a city of Boulder that had a sign and I think someone reached out to us and said, hey, you should do something like this. And we did some research on it. And we decided that we wanted to place this sign on all of our flashing beacons. So we've updated that. We've updated our the, the pedestrian push buttons. Um, I don't think anything else, anybody super interested in. Um, push button extensions may be required to comply with ADA requirements and then another, um, the need and use for APS features. Need to follow MUTCD and FHWA. So some more ADA comments in there. This is just showing what it looks like in this view. Moving on, we also added this detail. Um, Public Works helped me with this quite a bit, um, just to show exactly how we we like these circular rapid flashing beacons to to be um, designed and built. Hopefully, it'll help. Um, moving on to street name signs. So, um, this was an error that I had made in the previous in 2017, I guess. Um, the six inch or no, the nine inch didn't add up over on this right side. So I had to fiddle with some of these heights of the letters. Moving on, this is a traffic signal street name sign. So these are the signs that hang on a traffic signal. Um, we just added a comment right here of the type of mounting bracket that we use and that we would prefer for mounting these on traffic signal. Moving on, sign post details. So the one on the left existed before how a post um, is in a foundation in like gravel or dirt. And then on the right is a typical breakaway base. This is what we added. Um, this is for if a signpost is located on top of concrete. It's just put into the concrete and it, when it's hit, it breaks away pretty cool. Moving on, I'm almost done, I promise. Um, intersection striping, we just threw in another layout of what a street looks like as a T intersection with a left turn lane and a right turn lane and where the bike lane is located with that. Um, just added a legend here, explaining what that stripe is, not very interesting. 
This one's kind of cool. Um, this is our layout for crosswalks. Um, for crosswalks, if a gap is larger than six feet to the center of the marking, add more stripes as appropriate. So in the past, we've had some crosswalks and the stripes were pretty far apart, which sometimes if there's a huge radius or something over here, there, there would need to, it would be better to have some more markings. So we put that little note down there to hopefully accommodate that. I, um, I think that's all I had. Martin, did you want to talk about your drawings? No, he doesn't. They're still they're still pretty much in draft form, um, but but they're getting really close. So um, that's all I had. I'm open to any questions if anyone has any questions on the super fun stuff. All right, thanks, Stephanie and Martin. Um, we'll start with questions from the commission and then I'll go to public comment and then we'll do comments uh, from the commission after that. Um, so are there any questions from the commission uh, online? Council member, Council member McCarthy. Well, thank you. Sometimes when I'm driving down Butler or Route 66 in the late afternoon, I can't see the stop lights because the sun is boom in my face. And uh, there's a person in the audience right now that experienced that problem. At least I think that's what may have caused that accident. So, um, my question is, what I've been thinking about is what could we do about that? And one thought I had is, well, maybe we could put an, another signal lower down where if the sun were in your eyes, you could see it. You know, when you put your visor down and it blocks the sun, it also blocks the, uh, the uh, traffic signal. But maybe they could put one down lower. But then I thought, well, but then if there's pedestrians standing there, they would block it. But I guess my basic question is, in my mind, that's a real problem. And has staff ever thought about, is there a solution to it? The things I've heard of in the past are putting the retroreflective um, border around the traffic signals. I know ADOT had done that along Milton, maybe it was a year ago. Um, they came in and put all those retroreflective borders um, on the traffic signals, and I would have to look to Jeff to ask if we require that um, on our signal heads. Yeah, if you move, if you go back to the RF. RFB standard, you'll see it on that one. We've updated that. Those they're called retro. There it is, retro reflective backplates. So that's what you're seeing on this image. Um, are those retro reflective backplates? And those do, those do, those do show up in the HSM and the Highway Safety Manual as being effective. Um, I would guess east west for that issue, and also for lower lower light conditions. So we've called them out on the ped crossings. Um, We've we haven't called them out on our traffic signals at this point, but that's a good suggestion. We could look into that. One of the issues here is our really windy conditions. So in order to have back plates, we have to have louvers in them so the wind can blow through. So the back plate adds more. Um, it's easier for people to see the whole signal heads conspicuity. So we have big back plates here and we have to have louvers for the wind. And you can't do both the louvers and backplates and the retroreflective bands because they kind of take up the same space. So probably a little more research on our part to see if we should we should switch our methodology from louvers to reflective backplates, um, or if we could do both. But I don't know that we can do both. Um, and then your other question about mounting at different heights, we always um, have overhead displays over each lane. And then typically have a right side, right side and left side um, at about eight feet. Okay, that's good. And again, this is probably, you know, it's expensive to do all this stuff. So it's mostly needed for the east west, as you mentioned, streets. A north south street probably isn't even needed. But uh, anyway, if you'd look into that, that would be a good idea. Thank you. I have a question. How often are the uh, crosswalk markings supposed to be redone? I do a lot of walking. 
and, and I know a number of them around Elk Run were there at one time, but they're not redone and you can't see them. I don't know the exact schedule of what Public Works has for a goal. I know that they are under, they, they have positions, but they just can't fill them by huge percentages. And that's a big part of the reason signing and markings are behind. So tip, here's what I do know. So on our arterials, they typically try to paint them twice a year, spring and fall. So that's the long lines, the white, like bike lane lines and yellow lines. And then the way it used to work when they were fully staffed is they would do crosswalks and stop bars kind of on half the city one year and half the city the other year. So it's basically every other year. But I know it's not just your neighborhood, it's all over town where it's definitely been longer than a year or two in many cases. And they're, they literally just cannot hire people. They have to open positions for um, years at this point. Okay, thank you. We're, we're exploring with them some contractor options to try to get them back up to speed um, and get caught up because they're so far behind. Um, because it's something we've recognized. We've had some citizen concerns and they they obviously are well aware that they're they're super far behind. And it doesn't help that they can only do it certain times of the year, not just the snow, but the cold temperatures don't allow them to paint or put markings in in the winter. So they're really limited to a short season. Could you prioritize some of the busier roads and walkways and crossways then? That's a good suggestion. Yeah, we can. Um, we've been working with them on some of these issues to kind of provide our engineering input. So yeah, that's a good that's a good suggestion. I'll make a list. We we meet with them every other week actually to kind of check in on this type of thing. So thank you. Um, thanks for all those. Uh, changes that seems like quite a bit of work um and martin i'm assuming that you went through the atmp and you updated the code to match the atmp when necessary for bicycle and pedestrian stuff were appropriate yes we did we did a thorough a thorough review of the engineering standards and actually identified more changes but we divided them into three categories the easiest ones are the ones that are before you now that we thought we could get through relatively quickly uh, there's another set that are relatively straightforward, but need either more information or more discussion internally before they're ready to go. And then there's a final set which requires uh, more work still and, and um, more thorough investigation and discussion before they would be ready to go. But we did do that comprehensive review just based on um, recommendations and policies and, and guidance from the ATMP. Thank you. Excellent. Um, one of my questions is, is there um, the ability to put in queuing space at intersections? You know, if you're a bicycle and you stop to make a left and somebody's going straight through, there's not always like you've got to be somewhere to hit the button, but then you're in the middle of the space or if people are walking, it's the same kind of situation. One, one more time, please. I'm not, I'm not sure that I follow that. Sure. So uh, if a, pedestrian or cyclist uh, presses a button and is waiting for a signal to change, um, where do they put themselves in the pathway? And how does, is there an opportunity to increase pathway size around intersections to make it so that those pedestrians or cyclists waiting are not in the way of other ones that may be using the currently open access? I, I think we could we could take a look at, at that when we uh, review our standards for curb ramps at intersections. Um, Stephanie mentioned that PROWAG has become an official guideline. So I think one future set of potential revisions is looking at how PROWAG would affect our requirements for curb ramps. And I think as part of that, we could look at, at where staging occurs and if there's enough room. I've, I've often thought the same thing for foot trails, that it would be nice to have a little bit of extra room at intersections um, for bikes and peds to stage. ADOT has identified in the corridor master plan for Milton, for example, that there would be a benefit to having more room for pedestrians at some of the intersections along Milton um, for staging. And PROWAG may force our hand in that it may require more space 
uh, for accessibility um, features, but it would give more space for all users at those at those corners. Um, when I was in, it's interesting, the requirement for us to activate a button sort of affects where we have to be when we're stopped. And I know when I was in Belgium one time, they, you just stop on sort of on the side and it changes every time for you. And so you don't have to kind of get in the way to, to wait for that. Um, while we're on the topic of intersections, is what's the possibility of adding bicycle lights versus pedestrian lights? And if those would have a different time limit on them and if those would activate at different times uh, during a signal change? Some of the projects the city is currently working through and design that I'm thinking of Lone Tree and Butler, uh, Butler and Fourth uh, may include bicycle specific signals or, or at least um, a lead interval for peds and bikes, um, given the, the protected or separated nature of those intersections for ped and bike facilities. But that's not at the level that we'd want to put in the code at this point. Uh, I, I think, I, again, as, as part of a, a potential future revision, we could look at if if there's a place in the code to specify where we would want that to occur. Um, and if it can be reduced to a set of standards or if it's more case by case, and we would want to leave ourselves a flexibility and the designer's flexibility of, of where it gets used or not. So I, I don't know the answer to that, but I think it's something that we could look into. Okay, thanks. Question online? Yeah, Chair Koning, I have a couple of questions. Go ahead. Okay, thanks. Um, so in regards to the bicycle exit and entrance ramps, is there um, a specified signage for uh, vehicle traffic to identify the entrance and exit location so that vehicles are aware? It's a great question. I'm thinking through it right now. I'm trying to picture the locations that we have these currently at um, the roundabouts, specifically the one on Gemini. I, I, I don't believe there is a sign. Jeff, Jeff is looking at me. Oh, OK, go for it. Yeah, there's not a specific sign for bike ramps on and off, but the pavement markings are the indication to the drivers and the cyclists. So you can it's a little bit hard in this image, but it's that skip striping or dash striping typically that shows the beginning or the end of the bike lane. But there isn't a standard sign um, yeah. for that for that. Do, do you think that's visible enough to vehicle traffic to identify that location? So typically the way these work is the that that skip stripe line is just an extension of the curb. So the vehicle mm -hmm. lane just keeps going straight and then okay. the outside curb widens for where the bikes enter. So there's no merging or conflict. It's essentially more space is created when the bike lane starts. So it's it's yeah, I don't know if vehicles recognize it, but they don't really need to because they're just going straight. If that does that make sense? Kind of how yes. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, I do have two more questions, and and both of these are related to the pedestrian rapid flashing beacons. I I noticed in the design that it was showing the crosswalk was offset. Is that the current standard, or is that just kind of the ideal? Um, this is this is what we're um, showing for these. This is the current standard. Um, yeah. We've found that it is safer for the pedestrians. It makes them think twice before <clears throat> running across the road. It makes them jog over. Um, I know we tried fences on on Four Street so that they don't just you know walk through the zigzag and that they have to think about it twice. So okay. I do believe this is a standard at these CRFBs. Okay. What, what this I, doesn't I, I, do. I was just gonna add on real quickly that this is just kind of a schematic. I know we've had feedback from cyclists that they'd like to see the offset a lot closer or more of a Z when we have the wider median. This depicts a real narrow median. Our current standard is 15 feet wide, which allows us to be more diagonal and make it a lot easier for cyclists. So still offsetting, but you can stay on your bike. This one, the way it's shown, it's this would be a challenge to stay on your bike. Okay, good. I mean, I do like the offset. I think that 
um, definitely makes it safer. So that's good. And I have one more question. Um, is there a standard for the location of the push button activation in the, in the median? And the reason why I ask is the cross, the beacon on Butler and Humphreys, um, the push button is way too close to the street or to the road, you know, entering the road. Like you're almost in the road when you have to push that button. So it needs to be set back from the roadway. Interesting. Go ahead, Jeff. So the design at Butler and Humphreys was the first one, and we used okay. flashers mounted in the median, so we had to put it really close to the road. If mm -hmm. you notice on this exhibit, um, we're using overhead. So we're using a pole and a mast arm from the side of the road to get the flashers out over the road. And so the median mount now is just a button. It doesn't have to be placed out near the edge okay. where... Yeah, you don't like it because it's so close as a user it, and as yeah. an operator, they get hit all the time. Oh, OK, <laughs> yeah, I was noticing that I, I really don't like that uh, that crossing there because, you know, one, there's a lot of traffic, but it's also um, the, the the push button is way too close to the roadway. Just as a little update that that crossing is getting upgraded to this current okay. standard. Um, oh, as part of kind of these projects along Butler that we're working on. So no, I don't have a timeline for that, but it's in our work program to get that one updated. OK, great. Thank you. Commissioner Stone, you have a question? Go ahead. Uh, yeah, for. Thank you uh, for these kind of crossings. Is it? typically standard that each side is an independent set of buttons, I guess, um, where because I, I feel like a lot of times I see people, they think it's going to be all the way across and they actually have to press a button halfway um, and then it kind of leads to can lead to a dangerous situation situation when they're trying to cross the second side. Um, I don't know if there's yeah. like a way to time it. So, oh, you're going to walk 10 more feet and then you're going to cross the other side. Um, not sure. Yeah, I think I can answer that one. Um, we've designed these to push twice. Um, we want the pedestrian to interact with traffic um, crossing both legs. We want them to stop and think and cross versus, like I said earlier, just zoom across with one button thinking that the other one's good. Um, <clears throat> We've added um, a tiny little LED light so that the pedestrian can see if these flashers are on, because if you could imagine there's, you know, the big shield on a signal head that's blocking it and a pedestrian wasn't able to see it. So one of the things we've added um, that we show on that detailed page with the two heads is a tiny little LED button so the pedestrian can see if those are activated or not. So we just, we do the two different buttons and the two different cycles, phases, whatever you want to call it, um, just to make that a more interactive crossing with vehicles and PEDs. I'm not sure if that answered it well enough. I think we have tested. Um, I, I'd look to Jeff um, uh, an offset time on, on Lone Tree. Is that right, Jeff, where we tried to, or, or is it motion censored or something? What did we try on Lone Tree? On, on the foots crossing on Lone Tree, not the community college, but the other one to the north, uh, we do have, we do have, uh, I think they're infrared sensors, so there's buttons and infrared sensors, but they tend to get a lot of false calls, so that hasn't been a technology that's worked real well as far as pushing the button twice. The The other thing, and it's it's going to be site specific, if, if we can't have the Z crossing and it's a single lane on each side, we've been tending to run those as a single crossing, or that's what we intend to do. When we have a offset or Z crossing, and especially when we have multiple lanes and medians, we tend to run those as two crossings. Um, the the one other, yeah, the one other big benefit, at least with current technology, is that we're only we only have the beacons on on the side of the street that the pedestrians on. There, it's it's actually quite a bit of time to walk from one curb all the way to the other curb, and our our fear is that if we're flashing the beacons for 20 seconds and nobody's present the cars start to get conditioned, maybe that when the beacons are on, there's not always somebody there. Sometimes there is, sometimes there isn't. And we'll see a lot lower yielding rates. 
So responsiveness is really key to pedestrians wanting to cross, and it's really key to vehicles yielding. So, yeah, so it's a little bit not they're all the same, but generally that's how they've been running. Question, Jeff, that technology on the center islands, I remember we were talking about the infrared and reading it. That hasn't advanced. So as you walk through, they don't have to push it. It'll read people and temperatures. There's probably better technology. We've had that one up probably seven or eight years now. There yeah. may be better technology we can look into, but it it hasn't, it's been pretty problematic out there on Lone Tree. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I I wonder if we it would be a good idea to put a sign out in there, not for the traffic to see, but for the pedestrians to see that lets them know somehow that, you know, you just got to like to go across the eastbound lanes, but you got to start all over again to go across the westbound lanes. And so I think a sign that tells the people that uh, would be very useful. And then you, the sign might also tell them about this red light that, you know, where you can, you know, make sure the beacon's on, you know, and shows them where to look. But. With, with current, with the new pro ag, the new ADA stuff, um, we're also calling out the audible pedestrian signals. So they have the ability now when you push the button to actually talk to you and say, lights are now flashing for eastbound crossing. So that'll help. They're, it's advancing, it's getting better and better. The, the main idea is that the pedestrians need to be made aware that they just got to cross halfway across the street, but that doesn't mean you've got it going the other way. You got to start over, push a button again. And I think a lot of people don't know that. Are there any further commissioner questions before we go to public comment? Are there any any members of the public who would like to comment on this? Howdy folks, uh, thanks uh, commissioners, of course, staff, uh, council members. Um, I don't know if this is in regards to all crossings and all entry and exit from crossings, but I know a heavy, heavy pedestrian area is right out in front of Crystal Magic. That corner is awful for anybody who is not able-bodied. Um, the actual ramp of it is a pretty steep grade for anybody who doesn't have easily working um, bottom uh, appendages, and it kind of faces the split, right? So you have South San Francisco going towards the tracks and you have going across San Francisco, which would be at the corner tavern. And so you have that L shape, right? And the exit of it essentially splits those two directions. So it's not like you can go out and just go down and go South on San Francisco or go out and go down and just go across San Francisco, you technically, yeah, if you go can we get even like closer, closer. Yeah, I think so. So that's as good as it can get. So essentially, right, here's the push button and here is to cross and here is to cross south. Essentially, if you're in a um, wheelchair, you have to cross, you have to go off the ramp here. So essentially, you're 
if you were to go straight off the ramp, you go directly into oncoming or all traffic. Whereas if this was graded down to actually be able to go down this and go straight south, you'd be able to cross. Same with this, if this was graded to actually enter and exit easily, um, that would help out a lot of people who um, aren't able-bodied. Uh, I don't know if that's a standard that has to be put in uh, in regards to this kind of thing. I know I saw a lot of those uh, schematics and um, what have you, so I, I'm not sure how that goes, but just because it's a heavily, heavily pedestrian area, I think accessibility for everybody is an important thing, especially in heavily, heavily pedestrian areas. So that would be some place that I would A, look at not only that corner, but all corners in downtown Flagstaff, again, because it's a heavily pedestrian area. Um, secondarily, when we were talking about um, the striping of the crosswalks and different stuff, um, is there a potential for not only looking at other people, but looking at other organizations like say neighborhood associations, uh, volunteer troops, um, anybody who might not necessarily have to be employed through the city, but maybe given a standardized objective that they can participate in if they feel it is a necessity. And I know I'm probably gonna get told you have to have certain, you know, standards on paint and standards on how it adheres to the road and all that stuff. And that's for longevity, right? Because it needs to be durable. It's cars are going over it. Uh, ice, uh, snow plows are going over it, all that good stuff. I get that. But if you're having to do it annually, does it have to be like made to last multiple seasons? Or can it be made to last as long as it possibly can? And then next season, again, the neighborhood association, the volunteer troop, whatever that's, maybe you can get some um, uh, fraternities involved. You could get some National Guard. You can get a bunch of other organizations that aren't necessarily having to be on payroll or having to be stretched super thin in public works. And then, the people do it as a community effort and it's a community thing that's gonna help the community and not necessarily just rely on public works and payroll and that being the reason you can't do it because it's, oh, they're too busy. They have priorities, they have to do line striping. If you want bike lanes, well, then they can't do crosswalks. Well, what if citizens are concerned enough because I know I am, I see plenty of those sidewalks and I know a bunch of different places that I would love to see crosswalk striping. And I would love to get five of my friends together to paint some stripes on the road because although I know it's gonna be what well, you have to have the standardization of closing down the lane and you have to have you know the industry standards and insurance and all that stuff. I get it. I know how cities work and I know how insurance companies work. But is there a way to round about that? Because if they continue to not be addressed and they get continually pushed back and pushed back and pushed back, well, then nothing's on the road. So even if it's temporary, it's probably better than if absolutely nothing gets done at all because of a lack of people power. And then my final point, and I said it, you know, as a triggered injection, but I believe words matter and I believe addressing issues matter. And from a point of view of myself and moving forward through staff and in just daily life and council life, if you can stop referring to these things as accidents, they are not accidents. You are taking away onus of the people who are responsible for the things. Please refer to it as a crash or a collision because that's more what it is. People, it's either by design or by carelessness or by um, just physicality of fast moving atoms moving at other not so fast moving atoms and it's a crash and it's a collision. It's not an accident. So let's work on that.
Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Any other members of the public wish to speak? Seeing none. Um, are there any council members online who would like to who would like to make any comments uh, around this? Not hearing any. Um, well, great. Thank you. Um, this was helpful. I think we got some ideas and maybe the next rounds we can start implementing some of these protected intersections and bike stuff that Martin's going to work on. So thank you for everything. So how, do, how does this process work now? You guys will finalize these and this is an ordinance before City Council. Maybe we should have started with that, huh? Jeff will, Jeff will cover the, um, the schedule of it. <clears throat> So this was your first look at look at the standard updates. Um, the same presentation will be given to the bicycle advisory committee tomorrow. Pedestrians following week um, we will have a chance to look at this again or and if, if there was any questions that you want to follow up with, I'll have to look through my notes. I'm not sure there is, but we'll have an opportunity again at our February meeting to look at these one more time. Maybe there'll be a couple more changes that we'll want to highlight for you. And then it goes to city council kind of works it through the process in February. In between now and city council, we've got some mailers to local engineers and contractors, um, chamber of commerce, there's a whole list, architects, whole list of people that are interested in these typically. Um, we'll also be going, I can't remember the full list of commissions, but there's a couple others besides transportation and bicycle and ped. Um, and then as soon as we get that wrapped up, we'll take a breath and then we'll go into the next round, the ones that were a little bit harder. These were relatively easy and straightforward, didn't need a lot of input. We just kind of had to do the work to make them happen. That next round will start in, so maybe in April we'll start in on the next ones. I can't project how long that'll take to get back to you, but they'll be the same thing again. You'll see them again, maybe six months after that or so, end of next year, um, and we'll get those done, and then we'll have another round to keep working on. So we have, we have a huge list coming out of the ATMP that we're kind of just plugging away at. Council member. Um, are these approved by staff or do they get approved more formally, like through council? These are all, this is city code, so it all goes to city council. Thank you. Yep. I'm glad you're here that you have another round coming up. I guess I had some questions about um, the impact analysis that gets done and the modeling requirements of city code. And so maybe those will be for one of the more complicated sections. Those are definitely more complicated. <laughs> Um, excellent. So closing out that um, item on the agenda uh, coming up next is the City of Flagstaff Butler Avenue speed zone evaluation. All right, David's going to be doing Butler Avenue speed zone evaluation. Um, he's got a, a nice presentation that we'll work through and I'm sure we'll have some questions. Speed zones are an interesting topic, often kind of emotional, um, but there's this is kind of an engineering evaluation of current conditions, which is what we'll go through. Um, and again, hopefully we'll have some good discussion and back and forth. This is the chance for Transportation Commission to kind of give us some feedback. We will be taking, this was a request of City Council from back in May, so we're taking this to City Council in January, I think late January, as part of general Butler Avenue updates. So I think Public Works has some updates on plowing operations and things. Um, so we'll be tag teaming with Public Works to do the speed study and to do Butler Avenue bike lane pilot project update. So with that, take it away. All right, um, thank you, Jeff. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioners. My name is David Lemke. I'm a Transportation Engineer Associate here at the City, and today I will be presenting on the Butler Avenue Speed Study. All right, where we are going. So today I'm going to show you the purpose of the study. I'm going to touch on road hierarchy, uh, speed zoning concepts, the study results, discussion and conclusions, and staff recommendations. So the purpose of the study, like Jeff mentioned, during the May 2020 three or May 23rd, 2023 special meeting work session, council tasks staff with conducting a speed study along Butler Avenue between Milton Road and Sawmill Road to determine if the speed limit could be lowered. 
Um, I want to talk about road hierarchy. Um, it's common practice for municipalities to have a road hierarchy with a range of speeds to serve the travel needs of the community. Uh, this uh, hierarchy includes local roads, collectors, arterials, and freeways, and I've included the um, typical range of speeds you'll see at each types of those roads and a brief description on how each one operates uh, with local roads having direct access to commercial and residential areas. Collectors uh, connect local roads to arterials. Arterials are high capacity, provide inner city and interstate connectivity, and freeways are also high capacity with traffic interchange access and interstate travel. Um, here is an example of road hierarchy map in Flagstaff. Um, ranging from 25 miles or less up to 45 miles per hour. So we have different roads for different uses. Uh, this is another example in Mesa in Phoenix. They also have a road hierarchy system with different speeds. Uh, Tucson's, theirs is not as colorful and a little harder to discern the different um, speeds, but they do range from 25 to 55. And finally, we have Surprise, who also ranges uh, from 35 to 50. And this is just to show that it is common in uh, throughout cities to have different speed limits for different um, types of travel, whether you're going um, within your region or through the city or traveling across the city. And that brings us to Arizona Revised Statutes, which do um, govern how speed limits are set. And I want to bring particular attention, attention to Article 6, Speed Restrictions. and uh, in that article, it states that lo a local authority shall determine by an engineering and traffic investigation the proper maximum speed for all, all arterial streets in its jurisdiction. And but here's Butler Avenue. It is an arterial street in Flagstaff. Uh, these are the current speed limits, uh, 35 miles per hour from Milton to Lone Tree and 45 miles per hour after Lone Tree. And let's talk about some speed zoning concepts. So we have been referencing the ADOT traffic guidelines and processes, and speed zoning is based on the principle of setting the limit as near as practicable or practicable to the speed that 85% of drivers consider to be reasonable and prudent. Uh, speed limits established by an engineering and traffic investigation encourage voluntary compliance because they appear reasonable to the majority of motorists and posted limits that are set higher or lower than those dictated by roadway and traffic conditions are ignored by the majority of motorists. Um, to improve safety and efficiency, it is desirable for traffic to be going close to a uniform speed as differential in speeds leads to higher crash potential. And to encourage uniformity in traffic speeds, the 85th percentile speed of free flowing traffic is the standard starting point for determining the appropriate speed limit. Um, and just for a graphical representation, this really helped me with understanding the 85th percentile and how it corresponds to the first standard deviation. Another way to think of it is that it's the um, average speed of the vehicles traveling above 50% uh, or average speed of the faster vehicles, to put it another way. Oh, and it's also 85th percentile speed is defined as the speed at or below which 85% of vehicles are traveling. And that brings us to the study results. So we did um, pneumatic tube studies at several different locations along Butler Avenue uh, near the Drury Inn, the Murdoch Center, the Speedway gas station uh, twice, and Dutch Bros Coffee. And from our results, we can see that the 85th percentile speed corresponds very well with the posted speed limit. Um, so this kind of speaks to it being appropriately set as it is. Um, and this is another way or this is another point of data, which is how many vehicles were violating the speed limit with how it's currently set. And uh, that ranged from 7 to 17 percent, um, which is a good compliance for this road. And we also looked at it if we lowered the speed limit five miles per hour um, along the whole section, we would see a large increase in vehicles traveling over the legal limit. It would jump from uh, 7 to 17 to 35 to 63 percent traveling over the legal limit. So the results as for our discussion show that the 85th percentile speed closely aligns with the posted speed limit. Um, only a small percentage of vehicles traveling, uh, only a small percentage of vehicles are traveling above the existing speed limit. And when compared to other um, minor arterials in town and citywide data, Butler Avenue did not have an excessive number of speed related crashes. And due to the results of the study, the Arizona revised statutes and ADOC guidance, it is recommended that the speed limits on Butler remain the same. And that's the end of my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions. 
Are there any questions from commissioners online? Well, feel free to jump in if you do. Um, excellent. Thanks so much, David. Um, that's uh, a nice body of work that you've completed there. Um, I do have some questions. My one question is, do you know why City Council wanted to investigate lowering the speed limit? Yes, it uh, when they made the request, um, it was during the May 23rd, 2023 council work session. And during that same session, we had been discussing uh, the pilot bike lanes. And um, so I know it was related to that. And I believe there's interest uh, because the pilot bike lanes were trying to increase bicyclist comfort and safety along the road. I believe from the bicycle advisor no, committee, they go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I think I think we had a maybe a stray mic, but that's OK. Um, but from the Bicycle Advisory Committee, they recommended lowering the speed limit. And I believe Council saw that and asked us to investigate if that's a possibility. Thanks. Um, it's an, it's interesting. I think the study and the purpose of the study, you state that it's consideration of the road characteristics, the 85th percentile speed the free flow speed, the roadside conditions, and the crash history, and nowhere in that does it, do you mention the, any change in perception or, you know, any benefit to other users of the road? Um, um, could, could you cl clarify the question? I'm sorry. Sure. I guess, um, I think, uh, yeah, I think I, I can save my um, comments for after public comment. But yeah, my, my yeah, thanks. Um, one other question on the roadway and traffic characteristics section of the report. Um, you mentioned that the average daily traffic is 20,000 vehicles per day, according to the Tr Transportation Data Management System, ms2soft.com. Um, and then in your speed studies, you identify that it's closer to nine to twelve thousand vehicles per day um and so i guess can you explain to me how that software works and how that incorporates data from the city yes so ms2 is run by adot and includes traffic counts that they have collected and uh, we also have counts from when we did our pneumatics tube studies and we chose to do ms2 because it's more of an average along the road uh, you'll, you'd see 20,000 the closer you are to Milton, and as you get further away, that number does decrease, I think, into the teens, like 17,000, and decreases a little bit more. But we chose to do MS2 because it was um, more of an average. I think I can jump in on this if that's okay. Um, I think the 9,000 you're referring to is just one um, eastbound or westbound, oh. so you would have to add the 9,000 plus the 8,000 or whatever it's shown, and I think the numbers do drive a lot better than um, the nine to 20,000. Th thank you, Steph. Yes, I, I thought I heard 9,000. I was like, that must be way to the um, to the east. But yes, th we, we would have to add both both directions of travel to get to the um, the final. Volume. Great, thanks for clarifying that point. Um, this is just a curiosity for me in the uh, tube studies that you do. Um, so you said you t you choose a five second gap to identify the free flow speed. Um, and if the speed limits 30 miles per hour, it's 44 feet per second. So that's a 200 foot gap. And I guess, um, how is that gap chosen? And um, like, what are the typical accuracy rates of these uh, tube studies? Yes, so that gap was chosen, I believe there's studies in the highway capacity manual that with a gap time of five seconds, you will um, have the free flow speed of the traffic. And we chose that because it's, it's a faster speed. Um, and I, I might need a little help from, from Jeff on describing this or uh, making this more clear. So it, um, the way these speed studies are done is you're looking at free flow speeds, you're not looking at um, groups of cars, so you're not, you know, the first car in the line is the free flow speed. All the rest of would just be identical speeds, so you don't count those. So um, 
the software allows you to put gaps in, so you only collect unique values that have at least a five second gap or more in front of them. So we could have chosen four seconds or ten. Five's five's probably a, a reasonable. I mean, typical car following is at least a couple of seconds, so we're not going to get those people. But five seconds gives us a reasonable approximation of free flow speed. One, uh, a couple of issues with pneumatic tubes is we don't know if people were braking for a signal or accelerating from a signal, and there's so many interruptions along this corridor that, that we definitely did get some of that, because if you look at the actual distribution of the data, you get people going 12 and 14 are mixed into that, um, that grouping of data. Though, though it's a bell curve, it looks good. The data looks like um, it's good data, but that's why the five second, I can't remember if there was a second part of your question. You said, what is the accuracy of the tube counts we have looked into this. Do you remember the number? It's in the high 90s. I can't remember. Yes, I, it is in the high 90s. I can't remember off the top of my head, but they are, they are highly accurate. OK, thanks. And oh, uh, is it all right if I add something else onto that? We, we also had them in, installed on the road for at least a week or seven days to collect data to, to have a large sample size. Thanks. Any other comments or questions from commissioners? I had one. Um, so the I saw in the report that the um, FHWA tool recommended 30 mile an hour speed limits in two sections. And I'm wondering what the I guess I mean I guess the staff recommendation is that that you wouldn't follow that tool, but um, like how that is different at uh, determining than maybe the the ADOT guidelines. Yes, for US limits two, that has its own methodology for choosing speed limits, and uh, we chose to follow ADOT methodology, which. Um, focus is more primarily on the 85th percentile speed and trying to find a speed limit that encourage, encourages voluntary compliance. Uh, US Limits 2 uh, takes into consideration um, like the context of the road, like saying that it's an urban road. Uh, I think it bases things more on the 50th percentile speed, and that's why we saw uh, the recommendation of 30 miles per hour. But um, as as the city, we, we do um, use ADOC guidelines, and, and that's what we intend to follow rather than US limits too. We, we thought we would still investigate it to do a, a thorough study to see what it said, but um, due to the uh, issues of a higher percentage of ve vehicles traveling over the speed limit or violating the speed limit, if we lower it, and also um, the larger differential in speed we'll see with a speed limit that's not aligned with the 85th, we, we still recommend keeping the speed limits where they're at because they already align so well with the 85th percentile speed. Council member. David, um, was all of this data that used to uh, make your recommendation uh, taken after the uh, curbs, you know, the bike lane curbs and, and uh, candlesticks were put in? or was some of this data taken before they were uh, in? Some of the data was taken before the, the bike curves were installed, but the majority of the data um, was taken after they were installed. I guess my only point is that um, you might draw different conclusions if you only use the data that was taken after the candlesticks were put in. So it might be worthwhile, you know, going back and looking at the data again and only counting that data because I know myself, I probably drive slower through there now that the curbs and candlesticks are in than I did before. Oh, thank you, Steph. So Steph pulled up some of our more historical data and uh, on at least on this graphic, the one that demonstrates before the um, the candlesticks were installed is at Speedway. Uh, I don't know if you'd be able to zoom in, Steph, just on that particular spot. Ah, thank yeah, it's perfect. Thank you. So um, 
the count from October 2021 was before the um, the barriers were installed, and we noticed just a, a slight difference between the two counts. And um, we feel confident that the data we collected with the barriers in place still represent how the road is traveling because when we did put the bike lanes in, we had a before and after study. And then as well, we noticed that there wasn't much of a change. So we feel comfortable using the data even with the barriers being present. And a lot of them have been removed, or not a lot, but um, there have been a portion that have been removed since that previous study. So that might even speak to it um, behaving more normally than, than before, like when all of them were installed. Um, that answers my question. I can see that there's very little difference, one or two miles per hour. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's one thing that I've uh, learned a lot from this whole process making this study is that uh, it is really about the current conditions. Like, it'd be great if the speed limit was powerful enough to that if we change the number, it would have the effect of changing how people are driving, but it's really how the road's built. That's going to determine how these how people use the road. And um, that's why we're recommending to keep the speed limit for how vehicles are are actually using the road. If there are no, if there are no further questions from uh, commissioners, we'll move on to public comment. Are there members of the public that would like to uh, speak on this issue? Thank you, Ann, staff, uh, everybody involved, everybody here, everybody who's worked on that project. Um, I mean, first off, how extremely one dimensional of uh, data being taken. Uh, no anecdotes, no crossing the street while folks are going that speed limit, just putting little boxes and going sheerly off that, I think is a big undershoot yeah. on how impactful um, I think dropping the speed limit would be because I think even if you're saying you're not able to address too many people's actual use of it, at least a visual visualization and an enforcement capacity to really be able to um, punish folks who are going like 60 miles per hour, 55 miles per hour, because like you said, people don't go the speed limit. They, Most of them will, 85%, sure, 15% uh, will go over. And those are the folks who are going to potentially kill someone, potentially run into somebody because they can't see because of the uh, sun. Um, and I also think the footprint of this is a little lacking because I think it should be sawmill to Milton uh, because that's where the vast majority of your pedestrians and living, uh, just people who live in that area and use multimodal uh, capacities, that's from sawmill to Milton and you have a huge density, uh, not only of neighborhoods, but students. And we all know what do students like to do? They like to make it to their classes alive. That's one, but they're also very distracted. And they're also oftentimes the people who are gonna go above the speed limit. They're gonna be faster. They're gonna drive faster. So any amount of bringing any capacity for folks to uh, try to slow down, I think is a good thing. And if you're saying that a posted speed limit is going to do it, has there been other considerations of raised crosswalks, of, you know, median closures, anything to slow people down? Because you're coming into a high density area. So if you're coming from 40 miles per hour down Butler from the interchange where the McDonald's is and um, Desert Eagle is. You're driving 40, you're driving 40. You're coming up to Sawmill, you're still at 40. You finally get to 35 and you're already into a, again, a heavily pedestrian used area. A, a, actually, ideally pedestrian used area. And if you wanna meet your carbon neutrality goals, if you wanna meet your climate emergency dictates, 
you got to get more people biking and you got to get more people walking. And you're not going to do that if you continue to just have solely produced travel ways for fast moving cars. And sure, they're going to go the speed limit, like you said, posted 35, 85th percentile. I get all the data. I get it. But if we're trying to change behavior, we have to also change emotionality and people's perception of what they're using the road for. And if you don't think you can use the road as a pedestrian and you don't think you can use the road as a pedestrian, uh, as a cyclist, because it feels too fast, because uh, cars are zipping by you, because cars are not checking the right hand turn lanes, then you're not going to use it. You're, you're going to avoid it. You're going to feel danger. And a lot of this, yeah, should be more of a comfort issue than just a capacity issue. And I know we love to use LOS, baby, LOS, level of service. And that's primarily a motor vehicle conception because for LOS, for a lot of pedestrians and a lot of other road users is level of sacrifice. We have to sacrifice our time too. We have to sacrifice our safety. We have to sacrifice our friends. We have to sacrifice our limbs constantly and considerately to motor vehicles. And you will do everything you can to try to say that you don't have to do anything. People are driving the speed limit. People aren't getting in crashes. Vehicles are doing what they're supposed to do. But consistently and constantly, we see that that is not the case. And if you're going to design for safety, if you're going to design for people who want to use roads in multimodal facets, anything you can do to slow cars is going to help that. Anything you can do to get cars off the road is going to help you with carbon neutrality, is going to help you with climate emergency is going to help you with regional plan, is going to help you with money expenditure for maintenance of roads that you can't seem to hire anybody to continue to work on in public works. Who's going to fix all these miles of roads if you can't hire any public works? I'll tell you what doesn't get deteriorated that quickly. Sidewalks. When's the last time a sidewalk got worked on in downtown Flagstaff where the vast majority of people walk? 35 years ago, 40 years ago, when was the 90s um, downtown revitalization plan? None of those sidewalks have needed to necessarily get maintenance. And yet roads, every year we sink thousands upon thousands, millions upon millions to extend, to maintenance, to continue to work at. You, if you want to give people options, you got to slow down cars. And you got to make it inconvenient for cars. And I just don't care. I don't care about LOS. I don't care about level of service because I care about level of sacrifice. There's my blood and my friend's blood on the corner of Butler. Oh, that's right. That's that street. Butler and Beaver. And there's plenty of other blood spills on those corners too. And there's plenty of mangled metal from cars that you aren't taking into account reading off of your road you know, assessment numbers, please take into account the human capacity of this, not just the motor vehicle capacity of this, because you're missing a big service to the entire community by continuing lead, always only offering level of service to motor vehicles. And you'll also say all road users. I don't care about all road users. I care about vulnerable road users because people in cars are going to go fast. People in cars have their own built in protections and all of us who don't choose to drive in a car who want to walk, who want to bicycle, who want to put some minuscule amount of trying to neutralize carbon into this crazy world that loves to glorify the motor vehicle. We want to use those roads too. We want to walk to Dutch Brothers. We want to walk to Whole Foods. And yet, we'll skip that. Because why? Because you have to cross Butler. And because it's dangerous. And because, you know, maybe you'll lose a life. Maybe you lose your friend. Maybe you lose a leg. But if we can try to slow people down, anything we do to try to slow people down is good for all road users. Thank you. Thank you for your comments.
Mr. Shimoni. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good evening, Chair, Commissioners, City staff, um, members of the public. It's good to be here with you all. Uh, my name is Adam Shimoni. I'm speaking on behalf of myself this evening. Um, and then someone who's been involved with this for a long time, I want to thank staff and David specifically for their for his work on this and the team's work on this. This has been a long time coming. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So this is one of Flagstaff's most pedestrian Focus corridors, right? We have NAU, we have downtown, we have neighborhoods right there along Butler in this specific area. And, and this is a section where we have a lot of pedestrian traffic. Um, 35 miles an hour, which really means 40 miles an hour, is, is deadly when we have crashes, right? With pedestrians, cyclists, and cars and vehicles going that speed. And every mile an hour going down uh, really counts to saving lives and making and giving an opportunity to another life being saved. Um, and the crash data shows us that these areas along Butler are extremely dangerous, especially, especially specifically for student age individuals. And whether they're on a bike or in a, in a car or in, on their feet, uh, there are crashes occurring and they are significant. And the bike pilot, when I was on council with Councilman McCarthy and others, um, that was, this was part of it was to slow people down, knowing that the speed was too significant and that we needed more protection for cyclists and pedestrians. And so, you know, one thing that the bike pilot survey showed us, I think like a year after the fact, was that there were a lot, there was an increase in crashes and people felt unsafe and they were colliding into the, into the barriers in their vehicles, right? And us cyclists were, oh, um, and basically just that, um, that, I think slowing people down will make them feel more comfortable driving in this corridor. And I think that the bike pilot acts as a natural traffic calming measure. Um, as a rider on Butler, I don't feel safe on my bike. Cars are going too fast. And especially with the, the, the recent removal of some of the pilot, um, I don't feel, I, I feel like cars are going quicker around those areas. And as a driver, I, I feel very comfortable at 30 miles an hour because that road curves and it has a nice median. And with the pilot, it really has some nice traffic calming. Um, wrapping up my comments, both the current and the previous council have asked staff to work on this. And I'm grateful that staff has worked on it. But commissioners, you have the support of the current and the previous council. Uh, that being said, they haven't seen staff's recommendation, but I think we all wanna see this, this corridor um, slow, slow down and Lastly, the city's doing a lot along Butler, east to west, and we have a real opportunity to um, lower that speed to 30 miles an hour across that entire corridor. Uh, thank you for hearing my comments and looking forward to your discussion. Thank you, Mr. Shimoni. Are there any other members of the public who'd like to speak? Not hearing or seeing any, we'll go into closing commissioner comments. I see uh, Councilman McCarthy, do you have a comment? Uh, just a quick one. It, I'm thinking that the pedestrian advisory uh, committee might be interested in seeing this presentation. Uh, I see Sam has his hand up. Were you uh, hoping to make a public comment before I closed it there? I was. I apologize. It just wasn't quite quick enough on the draw. Sure, go ahead. Uh. Um, so again, I apologize. I was actually walking home while you all were talking about the speeds on Butler. Um, I just wanted to offer feedback as a pedestrian and cyclist who doesn't own a car that those some of the crossings on Butler, as I'm sure you all were just talking about, are really hot spots for accidents. I know I've seen quite a few either near misses or actual accidents on Butler between Milton and sawmill, particularly because of the proximity to campus. I think with um, the large number of people who are crossing Butler in that stretch all the time to get to and from campus, including not only students, but also faculty and staff who are flight staff residents, it would be really, really beneficial for the safety of all of those who have to go to and from NAU, including me, to look at lowering the speeds on Butler in general, especially at the rapid flash and beacon crossing on Butler that's near the high altitude conference center. I've seen lots of near misses 
Um, I know that folks are supposed to slow down at those beacons, but uh, I'm here to tell you they don't, or at least several cars won't before one will. And when folks are trying to cross and maybe not being as aware as they perhaps could be, or assuming that folks see them when they don't, that higher speed really can be deadly, right? We know that the higher vehicles are traveling, the higher speed vehicles are traveling, the more likely that any kind of incident between a bicyclist and pedestrian in the vehicle will be fatal. So I think we have a responsibility to think about just how many people in this city go to and from NAU and to provide for their safety, right? Not to mention other parts of um, other areas that Butler runs close to that have a high volume of pedestrians and cyclists. So again, I apologize if you covered this already, but thank you for hearing my comment. Thanks for taking the time to make a comment. Um, are there any other any commissioner comments that I'd like to and just go ahead, I think. Um, I have a comment, Chair Koenig. Um, I did put it in the chat, but I think that in, this might not be the time for this discussion, but I do think that we should look at leading pedestrian crosswalk indicators at every signalized crosswalk in Flagstaff as the standard for the city. Um, I can't think of a single one in Flagstaff at the moment, um, but it seems like the prudent thing to do to improve pedestrian safety at, at uh, signalized crosswalks. Um, and I don't know why we don't put that as a high priority to put in place here. Thank you. Thanks for your comments. Any other comments online? Not seeing any. Thanks again to David and staff for this. Um, I do have some comments. Yeah, so I guess my sort of what I was getting at earlier. Um, if the council requested that you look at. Changing the speed as a way to increase pedestrian and bicycle safety. Um, I recognize all of that. You followed the rules very well here and you made a very good recommendation based on the ADOT rules. Um, I guess I'm not sure those ADOT rules align with the expectations and desires of our community. And so, um, yeah, you know, I, I read your report and and I understand the idea of, hey, let's, you know, we don't want to have people going over the speed limit for the free flow of cars. This report makes total sense. Um, I don't think it makes sense for or I don't know if it makes sense because I don't know if there were that many considerations given to um, pedestrians and cyclists in this report. And so, you know, I think that may be an overriding factor that while, uh, yeah, and I get, you know, one of the interesting things that I saw was in the excerpt from the ADOT TGP 222 speed studies. Um, some of the factors they talk about considering number or letter J, they call it side friction and they say roadside development parking bicycle use and pedestrian activity and i think it's interesting that they refer to bicycles and pedestrians as side friction that's slowing cars down um yeah so i guess that would be and i think we heard that feedback from residents and i think we heard that feedback from other members of the commission and so um I would, I think, it, I, would, I look forward to you presenting this to the bicycle and advisory, bicycle and pedestrian advisory committees as well. Um, but I, you know, maybe as an addendum would be, hey, changing the speed limit may not change speeds, but here are some other options we can continue to reduce the sides. I know you, I know the uh, the staff is looking at a grant for changing the sidewalks. Um, adding raised intersections, you know, like what else can be done in order to slow speeds down if changing the speed limit won't work in order to meet the overall goal and the desires that council requested. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I agree in, in this report, I didn't highlight some of the other things that are going on concurrently on Butler to um, improve 
the conditions for pedestrians and bicyclists. Like you said, we do have a grant out for safe streets for all to um, uh, raise the bike lane to the same level as the sidewalk and include a parkway along Butler to increase the comfort and, and safety of the corridor. And uh, yeah, the focus of this um, study was to look at the current conditions and see if based on that if it could be lowered. But I, I hear you on um, as far as the expectations of what council and the community wanted that might not have been what they were looking for. So I, I think we will um, highlight the other things we're doing to address the concerns because that, that might get lost in what's currently uh, provided. Thank you. Um, so with that, that concludes item three. Um, there's nothing in the old business. Uh, all we have is concluding new business, or concluding general business and information items to from commissioners and staff. All right, thank you, Chair. So I will be covering uh, with these uh, informational items from commissioners and staff. Oh, two from commissioners and staff with a little help from my friends um, that I'm working with. So um, commissioner discussion, uh, I'm not sure exactly what that one is. I might need a little help with Jeff for commissioner discussion. Is that for the rules and responsibilities? Okay. Um, do the commissioners have any general discussion points or should we roll on into, uh, I guess if nobody pipes up, just go ahead and keep rolling, David. Okay, great. Uh, a boulder point traffic calming item two, uh, an update for that. We put it out to our job order contractors, but didn't really receive a competitive bid. So we're going for open bid in the spring and um, we'll keep you informed on how that develops. But we have the 100% design plans that have gone through all the departments. So they're ready to roll. We're just uh, waiting for um, construction season to start to get that going. Uh, and that's also wrapped up with Woodland Drive. Those two projects are one and the same. Uh, Butler corridor improvements. Um, I might need, yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, number four and five, Butler corridor improvements and transportation alternatives. So you kind of led us into that a few minutes ago, but the transportation alternative grants were announced a couple of weeks ago and we were awarded design funds for rebuilding Butler and Beaver and Butler and San Francisco intersections. So designs will move forward as we kind of get that thing, get that going, but we now have funding to rebuild those and that would, those intersections are envisioned. We've got those concept plans that I think some of you have seen, but they would have, um, at least in the concept level right now, they would have the bike signals that you've talked about tonight. They would probably have leading pedestrian intervals and some of the other features that people have been wanting to see in these really urbanized high ped areas. So that's good news on those two intersections. The Safe Streets for All grant is a larger grant, um, over $10 million to rebuild all of Butler from Sawmill to Milton. As David mentioned, moving the curbs in, raising the bike lanes um, to the to the side of the sidewalk, and that that really does have a lot of potential to lower operating speeds on Butler, and definitely makes things a lot more comfortable on a high volume street. If you're not a bike in the street, you're up on the sidewalk. So that's the vision. It's a lot of money. We're really hoping that grant comes through. Uh, we've been told middle of December, which is like a week away. So we'll know real soon. You'll probably hear about it. It's a big enough grant. We'll make make an announcement if we do get that. Oh, uh, thank you, Jeff. That brings us to Fremont uh, Boulevard. Uh, two updates on that. We, uh, through Metro Plan, did receive a grant for asphalt art. So we're actively working with them to find the best areas, like a canvas uh, to paint in, in the road while still uh, being in compliance with MUTCD. So we're working with them on that. And we've also, we completed our walkthrough in the neighborhood survey, and we're compiling that data into another set of traffic plans. Um, that we're hoping to distribute to the neighborhood for feedback uh, by before the end of this month, hopefully in the next couple weeks. And uh, once we hear back from them on the, the ultimate traffic calming plans, we'll be working on um, 
getting those installed and finding uh, out how much we have budget for that, the, like the next steps in that process. That, that's where we're at with the Fremont Boulevard traffic calming. And you, you want me to do seven? Nope, so, I got okay. seven. Cool. So crash report, we talked about the, the last month and you, I think there were some questions and discussion about kind of what happens throughout the year. So we're working with ADOT on our, what's called a road safety assessment for, um, we call it Route 66 when it's at Steve's and then going east or north, it turns into Highway 89 all the way up to Marketplace. So we're working with ADOT on a road safety assessment. So basically there's kind of an expert team that's brought on site, we walk the street, look at crash reports, and try to come up with some things to address the actual crashes that are happening along that corridor because we did identify that as a high part of the high crash network. So that's the quick update on crash report. Meeting schedule, you've all seen the appointments. So February and on through all the even numbered months have been sent out. If you didn't get them, let me know. But I think everyone, I've been seeing um, acceptances coming in. So we're all set for 24. Excellent. Thanks so much, Jeff and team. Um, with that, I if there's no further comments, I guess I'll ask for a motion for adjournment. So moved. Is there a second? I'll second that. Excellent. And with that, the meeting is adjourned. <laughs>